All right. So we're going to pick up today with work on uh, classification. So I started talking about classification last time. This is the case uh, in machine learning where instead of real valued outputs like you have in regression, you have continuous valued outputs. Sorry. I, instead of real valued outputs like you have in regression, you have discrete valued outputs. Sorry. That's the right thing to say. Um, so instead of you know, predicting a number like 0.1 is our peak demand, you want to predict yes or no questions like, is this device a refrigerator or is it not? And in particular, we're going to talk first kind of generally about classification. I'm going to give an example in building systems about an example of a classification task which we'll then use on the homework and, and other places to, much like a running example for regression was this predicting peak demand, our running example for classification is going to be identifying loads in a building. Another topic of, of a lot of importance to, to the smart grid. After that, we'll talk in particular about one very common type of classification algorithm called logistic regression. It's sort of sad this is called regression here, because it makes people think of regression, but logistic regression is a classification algorithm as predicting zero or one, I guess negative one or one items. So we'll do that. Um, and then, if we, and, and in particular, to talk about logistic, logistic regression, I mean, we're going to also want to talk a little bit about Newton's method. Unlike least squares, logistic regression does not have an analytical solution. You can't write theta star equals some matrix expression and have that just be that. Instead, you need to actually use an iterative process to find the best solution to this optimization problem. The one we're going to look at in particular is called Newton's method. Uh, and we're going to talk about that not just because it's useful now, but actually we're also going to come up with, uh, we're also going to have Newton's method come up later in the course when we talk about power flow. We talk about systems of, of equations uh, describing how smart grids and electrical grids in general work. We're also going to use Newton's method to solve these equations. These equations are also, they don't have an analytical solution. So this is going to be useful for both logistic regression and the class today, but it's also going to be a pretty general method that uh, is, is going to be very useful and so it's good to be quite familiar with it and spend some time to kind of just getting, just getting this one. And finally, if we have time, though I'm not sure we will, we'll talk some about evaluating machine learning algorithms and how you actually go about, if you run a machine learning algorithm in your big, your paper, or you run it on some data that you have, how do you know if it's actually doing well or not? How do you know if it's overfitting your data or not? All these questions we've kind of touched on a little bit so far, but we're going to answer this much more concretely here. I'm not sure if we'll get to this. We have a lot to cover today in classification, but maybe we'll get to this as well. All right, so let's jump right in. Uh, remember, I was introducing last time a problem in building systems. And the problem here was a question of trying to report to users information about what's going on in a building. Right? For example, if you were to tell, if you were to monitor these plugs, and oops, not working. If you were to monitor outlets in a building, um, but maybe you don't want to go to the trouble of kind of identifying every device, people can move devices around from different plugs. Uh, and so you just want some sort of automated way of knowing if you have these traces of power from each plug, how can you know what's actually plugged in there? What sort of devices are behind that, that wall? Or in this case, behind the electrical cord, I guess. And as I said, this is very useful for sort of giving feedback to buildings uh, about or to users of a building about what things they can do to maybe save energy going forward, right? If we sort of see a breakdown of our consumption in the building, we can make better decisions going forward. And you might think it's a little bit unrealistic, at least initially, right? Because we're assuming that we do have kind of separate power signals for each different appliance. But it turns out, and a lot of my research focuses on this actually, is very similar methods can be used to identify different devices and figure out what's going on in a building just by monitoring the whole meter of that building. So just by monitoring the, the single aggregate source, we can do a lot of very similar things as this. We're not going to talk about that in this class, but, but some, many of the same techniques apply here. So let me describe my problem a little bit, this problem here, a little bit more in a little bit more detail. Um, here is a power signal for a refrigerator. So if you were to, this is time on the x-axis in seconds, and power on the y-axis in watts. 
Now, if you were to plug in a refrigerator and you know, plug in a kilowatt or something like that, a kilowatt's a little device that records power for that single outlet there, and you were to log it every second or so, exactly how much power it was consuming, you would get a chart that looks like this. Now, this is not uh, me turning on a refrigerator on and off, you know, at every few ten minutes or so. What I'm actually doing, what's actually happening here is that the way refrigerators work is that they have a compressor that runs, but it doesn't run the whole time. It runs for a little while and it has lots of power so that, you know, it has power to cool it down a lot. And it'll run for a little time until the temperature in the refrigerator reaches some lower bound and then it'll turn off and wait for it to reach some upper bound and sort of repeat this process, keeping the refrigerator within some kind of range of temperature. That's how they work. I actually have a lot of devices work. Air conditioners, air conditioners will typically work the same way. Um, a lot of devices operate like this because it's kind of simpler oftentimes to program the control logic of a device to just turn on or off in response to what you see rather than try to kind of smoothly interpolate the, the control signal to try to get something that, that's, you know, somehow maybe a smoother signal. And also in, in terms of the actual hardware itself, things like compressors can sometimes work more efficiently if, you, if they're either on or off, not like they're in some intermediate state in between. So this is what a refrigerator looks like. And as you can imagine, this is pretty kind of, this looks somewhat unique, not unique entirely, but this looks, you might expect, you know, if you look at a lot of different devices, you might not see a lot that are exactly like this. Both in terms of the total power that consumes, so whatever, you know, power amount, 150 watts, you might find a couple other devices that consume the same amount, but both the amount and kind of the length of time it's on for, these kind of things you might think as a whole can give you a pretty good sense of what this device is. Right? So if you see something like this, you can make a pretty good guess that it's going to be a refrigerator. So, and actually I should also say, um, not only can you make a guess of this, one, uh, uh, this refrigerator, but actually different refrigerators, while they're, while they're similar, they do have different characteristics too. So this is another refrigerator, for example, that consumes a little bit more power, but it's on for a little bit less time. So the task I'm going to start out with first is just distinguishing between, between these two refrigerators. This will make it kind of a, a, an easy binary task, right? Is it this one, refrigerator A, or refrigerator B? Um, we don't want to identify that because maybe you want to know what kind of model someone has on a refrigerator without asking them, right? When you want to detect it automatically. Later on, I'll also talk about distinguishing between a refrigerator and everything else. But that's a little harder problem because as you might imagine, there's sort of a lot more everything else with a refrigerator. If you're just looking at two, it's you know, pretty well defined. You have these two options here. So remember, to come up, to sort of plug things into our classification problem, the thing that we needed to describe inputs are these features, right? Now before we had kind of a very nice fixed input, right? Which was just, you know, the, the, actual, the actual high temperature for the day. Here our input in some sense is actually this whole signal. But we can simplify it a little bit. And I guess what you call features here versus the input can kind of, is somewhat arbitrary, which, what you call a feature and what you call inputs. Um, but one very simple representation of this, and I guess I'll actually call this our input here, is we're going to use two inputs to describe these refrigerators. Right? We're not going to use the entire signal. That would be a very long vector that we need. And it would kind of be a little bit arbitrary too, right? I mean, does, you know, it depends on the, how much we sample it. It would depend on if, you know, if we're missing some data. Different signals by different lengths. So how do you really compare those two in the same thing? So that's, that's kind of a complex descriptor of this input. Instead, we're going to just use two inputs describing this refrigerator. And that's going to be the total power it consumes when it's on and the length of time it stays on for. Okay, so it's really simple. I'm just basically taking this thing, I'm doing the kind of the obvious thing of just calling the on level a fixed level. We're going to take the average there. So I'm going to take the average power when it's on. It has this little weird characteristic too uh, where it starts a little, a little higher uh, power consumption than, than what it ends at. But we're going to ignore that for now. By the way, you might want to actually not ignore that if you're building a more complex model here because that might actually have a lot of information about the device. But just ignore that for now. So here is our descriptor of what this refrigerator looks like. So basically we have two numbers describing it. Where's the eraser? Hmm. Someone actually take the eraser? Oh, there it is. 
That would be a weird thing to steal. People, people take the uh, markers a lot, but they're actually useful elsewhere. I can't imagine this would be that useful elsewhere. All right, so, so the x value, and I should have I've actually written it here, right? So the, the x item here would be, say, the power it consumes and maybe the time it's on. Okay? And the question we're trying to answer is, is this refrigerator here described in terms of this signal? And every time we see it on, maybe we take another guess of what that, what that is. Um, is that fridge one or fridge two? So let's first plot what this looks like. Remember, our, our sort of, um, when we talked about regression, we would frequently show these plots, right? And the way you should think of regression is you're trying to fit some function to a set of inputs instead of outputs. Classification is the same way. So let's look at that for that first and kind of looking at only one of these two dimensions. Let's look at the power that it consumes. And if we plot this classification problem in the same way we plotted the regression problems, with, with just looking at one of these two inputs here, just the power here, we actually have a graph that's actually somewhat equivalent to what we had in regression. It's just that instead of having a real valued output, our outputs either take value plus one or minus one. Right, so this graph here is showing power on the x-axis, and it's showing the label the output on the y-axis. It's just that unlike before, the output was a real valued number. Here the output is just either plus one or minus one. It's plus one, I think, let me just see if I can have this right. I think it's plus one for this refrigerator here uh, and minus one for this refrigerator here. And so what you see is that right now I'm just using the power to describe these things. And the, that second refrigerator uses a little bit more power, right? And so sort of on this side, you sort of see these ones. But by the way, you know, different times they come on might have slightly different average powers depending on how long they stay on for, depending on maybe how much your fridge is cooled down in between, whether you opened it or not in between. So there's actually quite a bit of variance here. It's not like they use the exact same amount of power every time. There is some variance just because they stay on for different amounts of time. They also have things like defrost cycles and stuff like that um, that all affect this kind of stuff. So there's actually a pretty wide range of, of average power consumption here. This graph, however, is, it, it's fine, it's sort of a nice thing, but it's, it's, we're sort of wasting a little bit of space here, right? Because we can also just identify all the minus one labels with one color and all the plus one labels with another color, and actually now we don't even need to bother with saying what their value is, having this y-axis here, right? Because we can identify them just by their, their color. You know, red for minus one here and blue for plus one. Does that make sense to everyone? Sort of this, this graph here and, and what I'm showing. Because the, the actual graph you should have in mind for classification, which is typically what you'll see, is something like this. Which is actually now where I'm plotting both these two inputs. And I'm not actually plotting the output on either of the two axes. What I'm doing is I'm plotting these two inputs on the two axes. So here's the power. And here is the axis of how long it stays on for, the duration for that signal in seconds. And I'm plotting all the data points here where my plus one outputs are in blue circles and my minus one outputs are in uh, red X's. So really this is actually more like a 3D graph, right? Where the, um, you know, these ones are all sort of sunk into the screen a little bit. And these ones are all popped out of the screen a little bit. But we don't need to bother with that. The X, there's a Z axis here, I guess, because it's all the same, right? It's, we can just identify them by their color. And just like linear regression was about fitting a line to data, this, this is without the nonlinear features, just linear features, what classification, linear classification is going to be about, the picture to have in mind, is drawing a line through this graph here that separates on one side one set of examples and the other side the other set of examples. Okay? So that's kind of the, the, the form of, of that we should be, be thinking of here. But again, what's happening here is not quite that we're fitting a line through this uh, like a you know, slope and intercept, though you can obviously put it in that form. What you should really think about is that what we're doing is we're fitting a plane to this 
three-dimensional data set. And that line there is where that plane crosses the zero z-axis. So really, does that, does that make sense to everyone? Because this is sort of a subtle point, but it's kind of good to get this solidified. Um, if we have one input, um, and say that we had you know, our, our negative example, so this is our input, and this is the output. And say we had some of our examples over here, this is our negative examples, this is going to be negative one, this is going to be positive one, and our positive examples over here. Um, what we're actually doing in linear classification is still fitting a line in some sense to this data. We're going to fit a line that looks something like this. So this line actually goes, um, you know, can go as negative as you want and as positive as you want. But what we care about, what kind of the, the threshold that we care about is when this line crosses the zero axis. So everything where this line is positive, we're going to call, we're going to predict to be positive. And everything that when this line is negative, we're going to predict to be the negative one example. I'll formalize this a little bit more, but, it, but it's good to not just think of it like, this is not a linear regression problem where I am treating this as the input and the output and fitting a line to this data. That would be a very different uh, problem there than the, the one I'm showing. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so let me formalize this again a little bit more now because this hopefully will show that the classification setup is actually really not that different from the regression setup. Right, so I'm going to define everything as we did before. So we have inputs. xi, and that'll be in Rn. We have outputs. Uh, in this case, yi is going to be, for binary classification, either negative 1 or positive 1. Just like before, and I won't, I won't write this down here because it's the exact same thing. We have a feature mapping right, that takes as inputs, takes our input as inputs to it and produces a feature vector in Rk. We have parameters model parameters theta, and just like before, our prediction is going to be y hat i. And you can sort of alternately think of this as either being, you're predicting a, you know, this, a discrete value, that's what we sort of really want to predict. But actually, it's a little bit more natural here to think about predicting still a real value number. So just like regression, we're predicting a real value number. And the reason why this is nice to do is then we have the exact same form for our prediction function as we did in regression. Namely, y hat i equals theta transpose times phi xi. Okay, so we're going to actually use the exact same predictions here. And we're going to, even though our, our outputs are discrete valued, we're going to use a real value prediction on them. And the intuition here is that what, although we're predicting real valued outputs for these, for these examples, ultimately then you're just going to threshold this thing. And if, it's ne if, if the real valued output is negative, you'll predict negative one. If it's positive, you'll predict positive one. So what we really care about in some sense is the sign of this prediction. But as we'll see, for thinking about convex loss functions for classification, it's actually much nicer to think about using the, having this be a real valued output rather than being a discrete valued output. Okay, and so the intuition here is that we want to, uh, sorry, this should be y hat. y hat equals positive one. Sorry, no, no. For y being positive one, right, we want y hat to be greater than zero. And when y is negative 1, we would like y to be less, y hat to be less than 0. We don't care, well, might not care about how negative it is or how positive it is. And that won't affect our actual kind of final classification result. Um, but this is kind of a, for technical reasons, it ends up being much better to think of the predictions still as being real valued. And in fact, real valued in this exact same form here. Are there any questions with, about that? 
I should say this is true no matter what. We always sort of care about the part where we cross the zero axis. So no matter what you know, our features are or anything like that, our prediction will always what always matters about our prediction is whether it's positive or negative in terms of our classification result. Okay, so <clears throat> given the setup now, we need to talk again about loss functions. So remember, a loss function was some function that took two inputs. In the regression case, I guess, it took two inputs. Um, but in the classification case, it's going to, well, maybe I should, I should say it more generally, a loss function is something that describes how good a prediction is, right? So loss is low if the prediction is good, it's high if the prediction is bad. That's the intuition. For classification now, we need some sense of when is this real valued prediction good and when is it bad, right? So loss functions for classification will actually be functions which are going to be mappings from the true output and our prediction to the real numbers. In fact, I'm actually even writing the real numbers plus. This just means it's mapping to positive numbers. Just like with, classific with, with regression, loss functions are always seem to be positive. We never have negative loss. And again, this measures, so L of Y, that's the true label here, which is either negative 1 or 1, and Y hat, which is a real valued prediction, this measures how good a prediction this is. So the most natural loss in some sense is to say, well, the loss should be 0 if this is the same sign as that. And it should be some constant, say 1, because that's a good constant, it should be 1 otherwise. So a very natural loss function is what's called zero loss here. And I'm writing it out a little bit, uh, I'm writing it out in two ways. So the first way I'm saying is that the loss is zero if the true y is plus 1 and our prediction is greater than or equal to zero. When the prediction is zero, we have to just sort of pick one or the other, it doesn't really matter what the prediction is at zero. Since these are real numbers, you know, the, the probability of getting exactly zero when you have some non-zero weights is, is small. I guess if you had zero features too, you might get zero, but we'll just pick one for zero. That basically means we don't know anything about, about that particular example. Um, well, I actually wrote this all over. I should probably have made that strictly less than one though. So, strictly less than zero just so I could, you know, make a commitment one way or the other. But basically it's zero if um, our true label is positive and if the predicted label is greater than zero, it's also zero if the true label is negative and our prediction is less than zero, right? Those are both equally good. Um, and so let's, you know, give a zero loss in both those cases. That's, that, that's the good case. It's also going to be one if the other thing happens. I'm just writing one otherwise here. But really what this is saying is that it's one if our true label is plus one and we predict something less than zero, or if our true label is minus one and predict something greater than zero. So that's kind of the natural, law. that's sort of just accuracy, right, in some sense. <laughs> How many of these did you get right? How many times did you get the sign right? It's worth though realizing that we can write this in a slightly more convenient way. We can also write, take the product between the true label and our predicted label. So let's look at that term. Let's look at the product of the true label and the predicted label. Okay, If this is positive and this is positive, and this whole thing, that, that's sort of the good case, right? This whole thing will be positive. If this is negative and this is negative, that's also the good case, this whole thing will be positive. But if they are different signs, this will be negative. So this provides kind of a, a single number that captures how good our prediction is in some sense, right? If this thing is positive, we're good. If it's negative, we're not, we're bad. So another way of writing this same loss function actually is just the indicator, which is, this is, the indicator function is a function that's one if the argument inside is true and zero otherwise. 
So one way of writing the 0, 1 loss, I'll write it like this, which is a function of y hat, sorry, y and y hat, is that it is the indicator of whether this product here, y, y hat, is less than or equal to 1, say. So that's not equal to 0. All right, so that is, that is zero, one loss, right? Does everyone see, know, know this notation, just the indicator function? Have people seen that before? Or at least can interpret it in this context? Okay. And what I'm drawing here now is a plot of this loss function where my input is this y times y hat or rather the x-axis is y times y hat, and then the uh, y-axis, x-axis is y times y hat, <laughs> and the y-axis is the loss you suffer. Right, so remember, if this thing is positive, we like that, because that means we have the same sign as our, the prediction is the same sign as the true output, so we have zero loss. If it's negative, that means the prediction is a different sign than the output, and so that's bad. Now, unfortunately, this is kind of the loss that you have. Yeah, what's that? You have a question. Uh, sorry, why is the one? This thing here? So that's a notation for an indicator function. So if, if I say something like this, one of a, um, this is the function that is equal to one if a is true and equal to zero otherwise. That's just, it's called an indicator function. It's just a, a defined function that is. One, if its argument is true, it takes sort of a, uh, it takes a, essentially a binary value as input, and, or it takes sort of a, a um, I shouldn't call it binary value. I just think of these things in terms of binary values. It takes a, a pro yeah, a Boolean value, like a probability event as input, and will output one if that event is, occurs, and zero if it does not occur. Probably shouldn't emphasize too much probability there. It just takes, you know, a, a Boolean value. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. And I'll put one, the number one if it's true, uh, the number zero if it's false. Kind of just like the binary representation of that Boolean value. Okay? Um, and, but, but at least, do you understand that in, the, in this context, um, this is a definition of this function? Right. So actually, that's just one way of maybe even defining what this is. It just means this thing is greater than zero, less than zero, it's one. It's greater than zero, it's zero. I think actually here's, I should actually have it would be less than or equal to zero, because that means if this, thing was all, if, if, this, if this thing was less than or equal to zero, then you could always get kind of the uh, zero loss by just using theta equals zero, right? And you getting zero would actually be giving you full credit for everything. So I should actually, this is uh, incorrect in the slides, I should actually make that a less than or equal to zero. Shouldn't get credit for just putting everything zero. It's not really what we want. So it would be really nice if we could optimize this, right? That's sort of what we, exactly what we want to do. Um, we want to find you know, again, in our prediction framework here, we have parameters theta. We would like to find the parameters that minimize this loss over the whole data set. And unfortunately, this turns out to be impossible. I'm not sorry, not impossible. It turns out to be very hard. <laughs> Take that back. Important, I didn't say that there. Uh, it's very hard. In general, uh, it will be NP hard, in fact, so definitely not impossible. You can do it by enumerating, by enumeration, but it's, but it's uh, not feasible to find the parameters, when you have a lot of inputs, to find parameters that will minimize this loss function on the data. And the reason for that is, um, maybe I'll just say it here because I can see the graph on this, this slide. The reason for that is that unlike the squared loss or the absolute loss, the 0, 1 loss is not a convex function. Okay, remember convex functions were functions where 
you could take any two points on that function, draw a line between them, and that line would lie completely above the function. That should be hopefully pretty apparent that that is not the case for 0, 1 loss. Right? 0, 1 loss looks like this. You can pick these two points here, and this line is not above that function. It goes below it. In fact, it's not even a smooth function. It can be really hard to optimize because of that, too. But for our purposes, the, the reason we'll say it's hard is that this is just not a convex function. And if you, therefore, tools like Yalmup and the other things you're going to be using on the homework, um, they won't know how to handle this by default. Or they can handle it, but they do it in a much more complex way that's not nearly as efficient. They have to kind of enumerate all possibilities of, of, of what these things could be. So this is kind of bad. This fact here makes this bad. So unlike in classification, where you might say, or sorry, regression, where you might say, you know, squared losses actually is a reasonable thing that we want to minimize. That kind of sounds like a reasonable, natural estimate. Maybe absolute loss is kind of the most natural estimate of difference between two predictions, or the, the prediction and, and the actual value. Um, in classification, kind of the most natural loss function that we have isn't really usable. We can't use this. We can't essentially optimize the accuracy of our prediction, strictly speaking. Because this is, corresponds to accuracy, right? It's just, you know, is it right or wrong? We can't do that. So what's happened instead is that people come up with all sorts of different loss functions, which are convex, and which in some sense approximate this. Right? Well, that, that, this is kind of weird, right? Because uh, you know, a convex function, in some sense, can't really approximate this in the way you want, right? Because you want a function that kind of tails off over here. Maybe it looks like this or something like that. But that's, that's not convex either. That still goes through this. Uh, I mean, that still, you know, go under the line there. So the approximations to this that are convex look a little bit strange. They might not look, look like approximations at all to this. But they actually are, in some sense, the best convex approximations you can get, on, uh, again. Not all of them are the best, but in cer under certain uh, definitions, some of these are actually the best approximation you can get to this. Um, so let me show one of these, and then maybe I'll make it more clear. So here's our 0, 1 loss. I have them all written down on the next slide, or I have several written down on the next slide, but I just want to show you one right now. So we want a convex function that approximates this as well as we can, sort of as, as, as low as possible, or as close to this as possible. What that function looks like is this. This, this is 0. This is 1. And it's a straight line that goes up and continues up here. This axis here, remember, again, is y times uh, y hat. This is the loss. OK? That seems kind of weird, right? But. What this loss function says is actually somewhat natural. It says, if my prediction here times the true value is greater than or equal to 1, that's, that's good. OK, so as long as I'm sort of confident enough in my prediction, I will get 0 loss. If I'm not quite confident enough, though, if I'm just sort of somewhat confident, predict like 0 0.1, you can kind of think of this thing as kind of a, a confidence in how much you think it's either plus 1 or negative 1. If I'm way over here, that's good. You know, I'm really confident, and it is, in fact, I'm really confident that it's either 1 or negative 1, and in fact, it is 1 or negative 1. Um, and here, I'm, I'm sort of really bad. So what this does, this kind of penalizes you not only for being right or wrong, but also for sort of degrees of how much you think you are, in fact, negative 1 or, or positive 1. This is a function called the hinge loss. And actually, if you optimize the hinge loss with L2 regularization, so remember, we're regularizing our parameters a little bit. This is a method called the support vector machine. So you might have heard that term in machine learning before. It's called it's, it's for, for kind of historical reasons, it's called support vector machines. All it's doing is taking this different loss, 
and optimizing it with some regularization. That's, that's, that's what it's doing. But let me show you a few more loss functions because these are all in some sense an approximation to this 0, 1 loss function. And they're all convex approximations. So one of these, uh, this is the hinge loss I saw I told you about before. Um, by the way, you can write this as the loss between y uh, and y hat equals the max of 1 minus y times y hat uh, and 0. All right, so this 1 minus this, this is this kind of line right here. And then if this is actually lower than, than 0, though, you just clip it at 0. So this, this is just the functional definition of this loss function. You can do other things, though. This is not the only possibility, right? Just like there are different loss functions for classification, you can have slightly different takes on this. Another, so another loss function is just the hinge loss squared. So we'll just take this little square. It doesn't change things over here, but here it makes it kind of like a, look like a squared loss, more like this. I have plots of all these on the next page, don't worry. I will show them. I'm just kind of drawing also an informal diagram here. Take that whole thing and square it. That's sort of also a natural loss function that kind of penalizes you more for being bad. But that's also an exponential loss. That is, looks like this. Doesn't actually ever reach zero. Um, but take this thing, e to the negative of this thing, right? So if it's zero at one, and it kind of goes like this. Maybe actually it's really steep here. Right? It goes very steep there and then kind of tails off. And then there's one that um, is actually really common to use, which we'll talk about a lot, which is called the logistic loss. And that has this formula. It's the log of 1 plus e to the negative of this thing, the prediction times the actual output. Um, and rather than try to sort of describe what all these things are, uh, I'm just going to plot them. So. This is a plot of these different loss functions. I guess I'm not showing the squared hinge loss. I'm just showing the exponential loss, the hinge loss, and the logistic loss. So the hinge loss is this thing that is, in some sense, kind of the best bound on that we can get, because it's sort of exactly added at 1, sorry, exactly added at 0, and then it couldn't possibly go at a lower slope anywhere else, because that would then violate the convexity of that function. It has to at least be, be linear after that. Um, the exponential loss, I and mean, these are all convex, I should add, which is probably pretty easy to see from just the, the plots, right? If you take any two points, you can connect them. And for all these ones, that line would lie either on or above the function. So we have our exponential loss, which is just an exponential function. And we have this thing called logistic loss. And logistic loss is, looks a lot like hinge loss, actually. Um, it, just like hinge loss, actually approaches a linear line, a linear function, as you get further and further away from 0. Um, and it also approaches 0 as you get further and further away from 0 in the, in the positive direction. Um, the difference, though, is that this one, unlike hinge loss, is smooth. It's differentiable. In fact, you can keep differentiating it. It's infinitely differentiable. You can just keep differentiating it, and it'll keep getting derivatives. That's not true for hinge loss, right? Hinge loss is discon discontinuous in its derivative at the point 1. Which is actually a reasonably big deal when it comes to things like optimizing it. Remember, absolute loss was kind of nasty because it had no derivative at, at 0. So we had to do some other crazy tricks to get this to work in optimization formulation. Whereas the squared loss was differentiable, at least twice differentiable. Well, differentiable everywhere. Just goes to 0, the derivative, after a while. Um, but, but here what we have is that it just this, this one you can keep differentiating as, long, as many times as you want. There was a question over there? Yeah, um, so I'm just wondering in practice, do you actually notice um, like, a, like a difference in quality with algorithms that use hinge loss versus like a smooth hinge loss versus like a squared hinge loss? Yeah, so yes, there is differences. Um, there's, there's, these do lead to different performance. But it's kind of a weird thing because often what you do in classification is you actually evaluate the algorithm as it performs on 0, 1 loss, right? Because that's accuracy. Does everyone, does, actually, does everyone understand that? That 0, 1 loss is accuracy, right? Because 0, 1 loss, you suffer a loss of 1 if you are, have the sign wrong, 0 if, it's, if, it's, if you have the sign right. 
So that's like a counter of how many things you got wrong. Because if you're ultimately going to make a prediction, you're just going to take the sign of your, of your prediction, right? Um, so people often will evaluate uh, the different methods using 0-1 loss, but then optimize a different loss when they're actually solving these things. Um, so that's kind of interesting, right? And it actually has to do with very similar considerations to uh, squared loss versus absolute loss in the regression case, for example. So you remember that squared loss goes up very quickly, right? So squared loss increases quickly. So that means any point that you don't get kind of, you don't, you don't do very well, you'll try very hard to make your prediction good on those points that are kind of far away. Maybe you can call them outliers. But basically, if you have some outliers, squared loss will try very hard to still do well on those. Um, and that same thing holds true in classification. So if you have a few points where this is very, very low, the squared hinge loss, or even worse, the exponential loss, will give you a very large penalty for those things that you got, that you got wrong. Whereas the hinge loss, or the logistic loss, will not penalize you as much. So maybe you try to make, you know, you don't worry about those outliers quite as much. Um, you let them be and you try to fit everything else that's sort of closer to your data. Closer to kind of the, the, the center of your median of your data. And that's, that's sort of the, the intuitive difference there. But then, in terms of how they perform on, as evaluated by 0-1 loss, that's going to depend on the data itself, right? Because if you have a lot of outliers and outliers really hurt you, then maybe you're better off using hinge loss, logistic loss. If you don't have any outliers, maybe you really want to try to get everything really tight on the boundary, and so you might, be, might, better off, might be better off using squared hinge loss or uh, exponential loss. I should say that optimizing logistic loss there, is that right? Yeah, optimizing logistic loss, let me make sure my colors are right there. Uh, that's a method that I talked about before called logistic regression. Um, and that's old. The funny thing is that's, that's like really old, it's kind of boring. Um, if you look at the number of papers, there aren't many papers published on, on logistic regression in the last you know, 15 years, say. If you look at hinge loss, that's a support vector machine now, right? Look at the number of papers that talk about that, that's huge, of course, right? So, you know, the, you, you can think of you know, machine learning progress right, as, as going from this one to that one in the last 15 years or so. I'm joking, of course, because the, the, the real appeal of, of, of support vector machines is, was actually their simultaneous integration with kernels and these kind of things. But um, it's really just doing, like everything else, minimizing some loss function plus a regularization term. That's what they're doing. And if you've seen them before, you might see them in terms of like geometric descriptions and the margins and this kind of stuff. You can define it all that way too. So support vector machines also had this beautiful geometric interpretation, which is very nice. But on some level, they're also just minimizing a loss plus a regularization term. That's, that's what they're doing. In this case, it's this loss right here. So let's look at, actually, did I, did I already see? Yeah, so I, I think I actually meant to put this slide up for, for a while. Um, the logistic loss might look kind of funny to you at first, right? Why do you pick that log of 1 plus e to the something like that? Um, and it actually turns out that the reason why you do it and why it's kind of natural to do a lot of times is there actually, and we're not going to talk about this in this class, but there's actually a very nice probabilistic interpretation for logistic regression. Um, you, you can derive sort of that particular model from a, a, a very nice kind of way of, gener uh, of generating general probability models for linear models like this, where, you, where your prediction in some sense is phi transpose, sorry, theta transpose times phi. Um, and you can actually interpret the predictions it makes uh, in terms of this quantity here. So that actually, uh, this quantity here is actually um, the probability of the uh, label being positive given your, your data. And this thing actually is the same as maximizing the probability of your observed data given, find the parameters that maximize the probability of your, of your observed data. I'm trying to say this as you, without sort of introducing any other terminology here, because we're not going to care about the probabilistic interpretation, we're just going to think of it as another loss function. But you should know logistic regression really is used and applied because it has this nice probabilistic interpretation to it. And if you see it described elsewhere, you will almost certainly uh, see that probabilistic interpretation and sort of go through that derivation as well. 
As I said, the support vector machine is another one that's just like this, but the only difference is you minimize a, the regularized hinge loss. And again, if you haven't, if you've seen these before, you might have seen them in terms of their geometric description uh, of maximizing some, some margin between the positive and negative examples, maybe with some penalties on that, but, but we're not going to worry about that interpretation here. We're just worried about the, the loss plus regularization interpretation. Okay, are there any questions at this point? We're going to slowly jump into one of these things. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to show you some, some code, but uh, we'll go through this first, and then we'll jump into one of them in more detail. Um, so the nice thing here, though, is that having given you sort of these definitions like this, you already know how to build a logic regression solver or a support vector machine solver. Uh, I guess you know this if you've already done the homework because the homework's sort of getting at this. Um, but basically what you do is exactly like you did with the absolute loss or squared loss, um, with a tool like YALMIP, you can just write down the actual objective that you have right, and minimize that. So let's take the support vector machine actually. Um, the first line is just I'm defining, just like I did before, a vector of my thetas, which is a, a variable that I'm going to optimize over. And then I'm minimizing some objective function. And the objective function here is the sum of the max of 0 and 1 minus y times this thing. Okay, that looks kind of complicated, but let's go through that in, in every term. So remember, phi, our matrix phi in MATLAB, is just our matrix phi that we have in, in, in the museum class, right? So this is an M by K matrix. Theta, just theta, that's our parameter vector in R to the K. So if you remember, our vector of all our predictions, remember our, our, our prediction still is just Y hat I equals theta transpose phi of XI, right? That's still our prediction in classification or Regression. And so, the, just like with classification, the vector of all our predictions is going to be a vector in Rm. And this is just equal to, what, what is this equal to? Yell it out in terms of these things. Right, phi times theta. Okay? That's just the vector containing all our predictions, as before. So we take this vector, and we're going to multiply it by all of our actual labels. We, we don't do this anymore. Before we did something like this, right? And that was subtracting our true labels from the predicted labels. Here we're not talking about subtracting them. What we really want to do instead, and I'll write this first in, uh, in actually I have to do it on the other side. Um, I'll write this first in, no, I'll write this. Let me erase that. Um, I'll write this first in linear algebra notation, and I'm going to show you how I do it in MATLAB. But basically, this, remember, is our vector in Rm. And so if we want to take each element here and multiply it by the corresponding yi, the true label, which is again 0 or 1, remember, what would I, how would I do that here? How would I form a vector of all those things? Oh, what would I write? How do I form a big vector where each element is y i times y hat i? Yeah? Do you have to transpose theta? So transposing won't really help, right? Because we, we, th th this thing here will be a big vector in, in Rm. Um, so we want to take every element of this vector and multiply it by the corresponding element of every element in that vector, this is just y hat, right? Multiply by the corresponding element in that vector and have that be our new vector. Do people rem remember how we did that? That's not the inner product because that would be the, the sum of all these things. This is one of the tricks in linear algebra. Is it the outer product? The outer product is also not what we want because that's, that's, that's sort of the product of all possible i and j terms there. Right? That would be a matrix. We want a vector. Do you remember how we did this? Right, you form a diagonal matrix. So this thing would be diag of y times that. 
Does everyone at least, having seen that, remember that this works now? Right, because diag takes a vector, constructs a matrix which has dia the, diagonal, the, the elements of that vector on the diagonal. So let's just actually make sure these are all the right size. Uh, this is going to be y is m, r and r m, so this is going to be m by m. This thing here, the whole thing, is, is m by 1. So this is going to be an m, this whole thing, I should say, is going to be an m by 1 vector. That's, that's right. Um, and remember, pre-multiplying by a diagonal matrix scales the entries in that vector by the corresponding diagonal elements of that matrix. So diag of y times this, basically the, the ith element of this, is just equal to y i times y hat i. So actually, when you write down your support vector machine in, if you were to write it in standard form, for example, you would have to do it this way. You couldn't uh, write it as like y times that. Other things don't make sense. But again, this is this being MATLAB. Uh, we're we're going we're gonna to use MATLAB's nice notation here. And the other way of doing this in MATLAB would be to say y dot times y hat. Right, we don't have dot times in uh, linear algebra notation, but but um, that would be how you do it in MATLAB. So what I'm doing here is is very simple. This thing here forms my vector of predictions. This multiplies it by every corresponding element of the true outputs, and then I apply my hinge loss to every element there. And MATLAB, and the reason why I can do it like this is that MATLAB's functions kind of very naturally will apply things element wise. So one minus this. That will do actually what I wanted to do. Um, that will take one and subtract every element of the vector from it and return a new vector where every element is one minus that, that of the vector. I take the max between zero and that. That's the, my hinge loss, remember? My hinge loss is the max of zero and one minus this thing here. And then I sum up all these entries. That's just the, taking the, the sum over all my examples of this loss function. Um, and finally, I'm adding a penalty on the squared 2 norm of theta. Okay, so this is how I construct my support vector machine in Yalmuth. And it, it, it looks a little bit tricky at first, but really this is, this is relatively incredibly easy in some sense, right? Because I'm just writing out exactly what my loss function is. Um, if you actually down, you know, read a paper on support vector machines, they, they will always write it in a slightly more complicated form because support vector machines came about before we had these sort of solvers. And so it's typical to write support vector machines in a different form, slightly different form, um, that is easier to input into a, a solver. But we won't worry about that here. We'll just, uh, for the homework at least, actually, I haven't decided yet for the next, this is not on the current homework, but maybe in the next homework you might have a problem where you actually have to translate a support vector machine into standard form, but for now you won't have to do that. You just use Yelmuth. Okay, and here is the resulting boundary you get from the support vector machine. Okay, so this looks pretty much correct, right? Um, again, this is a really a 3D plot where you have your two inputs and the Z axis, which you can't see. Uh, it's either negative one or one, but we're just coloring that either blue or red. What we're doing here is our, our um, features. So here xi is an R2. Phi of xi is going to be, sorry, R2. Phi of xi is going to be an R3, and it's just going to be um, the thing which is the two dimensions and an extra constant term. I'm defining my phi like that. This is the same as linear regression. I'm just using um, linear features of my inputs. I solve this thing. I write this thing down. And it chugs away for a little while. And it comes up with values, theta and r to 3, that minimize this thing. That minimizes over all possible thetas the value of the hinge loss. 
and then I plot the resulting, not the line, remember theta is a vector in R3. Does, she, does anyone know what I plot? So theta says y hat equals theta 1 times, I guess this would be uh, xi 1 um, plus theta 2 times xi 2 plus theta 3. Right? That's, that, that's, that's my prediction. Does anyone know how I go from that to this line, actually? This is not actually immediately obvious, but you'll have to do it for your homework. So, Because here we have our two axes as x1 and x2. So does anyone know how I get that line here? Yeah. Right, exactly. So you set this to be equal to 0. <laughs> 0 equals this, because 0 is the point uh, maybe I'll just write, this means xi1, <laughs> but I'll just write it like this, x1 um, plus theta 2, x2 plus theta 3, right? And then I solve for what y2 equals as a function of y1. Because typically you plot, you know, an x, and you plot the, the corresponding y. So what I do here is I actually solve for x2, right? So this is actually uh, you know, negative theta 1 times x minus theta 2 minus theta 3, all divided by theta 2. But the important point here is I'm sending this equal to 0. right? Because 0 is the point where it crosses that boundary, where it goes from predicting negative to predicting positive. So when you draw these things, you have to draw this solved for y hat equals 0. All right. Now, and boy, this is, didn't get through as much as I, as I hoped today, but I think I just maybe mis, mistimed the lectures. But we'll get through a lot of this, I think, and then I'll introduce uh, Newton's method, but I might continue next time because that one's actually a very important topic that we'll, that we'll want to, uh, to talk about a lot in this class because we use it more than once. Yeah? Uh, in the previous slide, there were a few points that were on. Right, yeah, yeah. So would it be a zero loss or one loss? Um, like some blue points on the right side. So, so zero, 1, so you have to be sort of clear here. Um, if you're talking about accuracy, that is zero, 0,1 loss, right? So if you're evaluating the zero, 0,1 loss of this classifier, I guess I'm not showing which side is which, but hopefully it's pretty obvious which side is which, right? Evaluating the zero, 0,1 loss, these would all have zero loss on this side. The red ones here would all have zero loss on that side. The blue ones here would have a loss of 1 for the ones on this side. They do not, however, have a hinge loss. If you're talking about 0, 1 loss, then yes, they're either set for loss of 0 or 1. The thing we're actually optimizing, though, the hinge loss, that is not the case. Okay? So actually, there can be two things. These ones here might not have loss 0, all of them. Remember, because hinge loss is positive for some portion of still getting the correct classification. So even if you're on the right side of the bound, you can still suffer some positive hinge loss. All the ones that are on the wrong side will have losses greater than 1, but it can be a lot greater than 1 if they're really far. So this one probably has pretty high loss over here, for example, right? Because it's, you know, draw the line down, kind of the distance between the, uh, the boundary and that would be its loss, and that's pretty high. This is where, it, where, you, where you're scaling appropriately, I should, I should say. Um, that's pretty high. Right? So, so our accuracy and the hinge loss are the same thing. But if you're thinking about 0, 1 loss, then accuracy and, and hinge loss are the same thing. So maybe rather than, um, let's have 20 minutes. So actually, I could probably get through a fair amount of Newton's method. So maybe I'll, I'll do that and introduce the, the, the topic. And we can keep, keep going on it next time. Um, so logistic regression is, is very nice in some sense uh, because you know it has a smooth loss function, it's sort of similar to hinge loss. It doesn't penalize things that are far away too much, um, but unlike hinge loss, it's actually smooth, so it's differentiable everywhere. Um, and there's a similar situation now to what we have with least squares, right? Where I told you how to use YALMIP to solve things, right? It's very easy. You can 
just type it, exactly what you want to optimize. It figures out how to do that, and it goes and solves it, and what comes back is the, the result. That's great. Um, but if you actually ran YALMIP on the least squares, you know, squared loss, it was probably, you know, maybe a thousand to ten thousand times slower than saying phi backslash y, right? It wasn't really com comparable at all. Um, and a similar thing happens with something like logistic like, regression here. So if you type this into YALMIP, uh, it will be pretty slow. Fine for like. It's not really prototyping your, your uh, algorithm, but if you want to actually run it on a large data set, you probably will be in trouble. Probably don't want to do that. Okay? So instead, what I'll talk about now is just like for least squares, we'll develop a specialized solution, in this case for logistic regression. Okay, but unlike least squares, as I said before, it's not like we can just write down an analytical solution. We can't write down like for least squares, theta equals something. We're going to have to use an iterative procedure to find the best theta. So this function here, this is my, my j function. We want to minimize over theta of this j, which is the sum of all these log logistic losses here. Um, if we, we can write the gradient, by the way, we can differentiate this certainly. Um, I'll show what that is in a second, though we won't, you won't have to go through the details there, I'll just write what it is. Um, we can differentiate this, but we can't actually solve for, if we, if, if we write this thing equals zero, you can't rearrange the equation to actually get a single solution for it. So what do we do? So what we're going to do instead is use a method called Newton's method. So who, actually, who here has seen Newton's method before? In like the, the, the 1D case in calculus. Okay. So let me describe it briefly. Um, if you haven't seen it before, it might be good to either chat with me or like just Google Newton's method and see the description for the 1D case. Um, I'll try to draw it right now, the 1D case. Well, I will draw the 1D case right now. Um, but we're actually going to focus on the multivariate case of Newton's method here in this class. And so, hopefully the 1D case, you'll sort of have that first as an, as, as an idea, and we can move on to the, the multivariate case. So, what Newton's method is, is Newton's method in the 1D, I should say, is a way, well, take it back. Let me first um, grab in the general case. In the general case, Newton's method says for some function, let's take some function f, that takes as input vectors in Rn and outputs vectors in Rn. And it's important that the input and output vectors be the same size here. Um, if it's not the same size, you either have multiple solutions or you could have no solution. A function like this, any function, what Newton's method tries to do is find some z in Rn such that f of z is equal to zero. Now that clearly will not always exist, right? If this is your function, here's zero. This is your function, there is no input that will actually make it equal to zero. But when there is, Newton's method is a way of finding it. Now, because there isn't always a solution, and there, you know, maybe even, and, and then there could be things like this too, where, where like it could be really down here. Um, for general functions like this, Newton's method can get very confused, and it can be kind of tricky. It will turn out, for this case we care about, there often will be, Newton's method will often find solutions uh, for these kinds of problems, but it's not always going to. But kind of ignore that, because for the cases that we'll consider, it will always find solutions. Um, now, the reason why it's important that this function has the same dimensionality input as output, hopefully is apparent, right? Because in some sense, the function has n different degrees of freedom in our, we can play with in our inputs, right? And we want to set n different output variables. So because this is a vector value function, right? You can think of it actually as n different functions or n different equations here if we want to set them all equal to zero. And so really what we have here is we have n inputs 
and or n variables and n equations we want to sort of satisfy. So if you had five variables and six equations, you probably couldn't do that unless they were somehow redundant. Or if you had six variables and five equations, you could actually do it a lot of ways, oftentimes. I mean, not, not always, because there could be problems there too. Um, but we're going to think of the case only where you have exactly the same number of inputs as outputs. So you have the same number of variables as equations you're trying to satisfy. But these, again, are possibly nonlinear equations. So it's not like you can just invert a matrix, matrix to find it. Um, you have to have some iterative procedure to find these things. In 1D, here's what this method looks like. So let's take our function in 1D. Uh, we have some function like this. That might be a bad one. <laughs> might have picked a very bad example there. Uh, let me do it the other way. Okay, here's our function. Newton's method says we have some initial point z. So here's our initial point z. And we're going to update z in the following way. We're going to say set z equal to, this little arrow here means we set z equal to the last z minus the function evaluated at z divided by the gradient of the function. Derivative of the function is z, or the 1D case. So here's what this is doing. What this is doing is it takes this point here and evaluates the function there. Okay? So that's th th this here, this point here is going to be f of z, right, on the y axis. And it also evaluates its gradient. And the gradient, remember, is the slope of this function at that point. Okay? And then it's going to say, okay, the actual function can be pretty complicated here. Let's approximate it with a linear approximation of this function. So a reasonable approximation of this function at this point is just this straight line, right? It's the function that goes through that point and has that slope. So we can actually define that, that function. What that function would be is it would be you know, I guess I'll call it like f hat of z equals, well, f of z, actually I should, say, I should use like z prime here because I want to use z as my point here. Um, f of z prime, which is our, our new input, is equal to, well, first of all, we just have f of z, right? It's equal to this kind of thing when um, z is equal to z. And then it's also equal to z prime minus z times the derivative evaluated at z. Right? So that's saying that basically the farther we get away from this, you know, this, this is going to be essentially this, this little number here uh, would be z prime minus z. So it starts off here, and then depending on how big this is, it follows this linear function here. Okay, so that is an approximation to our function that has the same slope as the function there and which passes through that point. What Newton's method says is, okay, look, it's hard to solve for the zero of the original function. Let's just solve for the zero of that function. Let's find the z prime that makes this thing equal to zero. Okay, and that will be chasing down to this point here. It'll be here. And the solution to z prime here Again, so this, this thing equals zero. The solution to z prime here is just going to be z minus f of z over z f prime of z. Okay, so that's exactly the Newton update. So again, Newton's up method, what it says is form a linear approximation of the function at the current point. I'll set that equal to zero. And find the point that makes that new function equal to zero. And then set that as your new point. So, that's the, so this will then become the point z. We do the same thing here. We form some linear approximation. Set this here. And eventually, it will, if we're lucky, uh, or in our cases, this will typically happen. Um, it will typically, in our cases, eventually converge to, to the actual point that makes that uh, equal to 0.
And in fact, Newton's method actually converges really, really quickly. When you get close enough to this point, and I'm being very vague there by what, by what I mean by close enough, but as you get kind of close to this point, and you evaluate how close you are in terms of like, like a uh, you know, floating point number or a number with some precision, right? The number of decimal places to which you're accurate will double at each iteration. That's, that's really fast convergence, right? That's saying basically if you're right to within uh, 10 to the negative 4 in one iteration, you'll be right to 10 to the negative 18, sorry, 10 to the negative 8 in the next one, 10 to the negative 16 in the next one, 32. So, so that's really, really fast convergence. It essentially, for all practical purposes, is exact quickly because you know, we only have something like 15 decimal places in, in binary representations anyway. Maybe sometimes actually 12 when you take into account a couple of rounding errors. So very quickly, this will find a solution which, which is precise to what a computer can actually represent. So this is the 1D case. And I'll just briefly describe the multivariate case now. Um, but we'll start, pick up again here next time and see how to actually apply that to do something like optimize um, linear regression and find the parameters that optimize that function. So what we're going to use here is the multivariate analog of the derivative. Remember, there were a few of these, but in particular, for vector input and vector output functions, so remember, f here is going to be takes rn to rn. For these functions, the, the analog of the derivative is called the Jacobian. Right, what that is, is that's the matrix of all the possible, possible partial differentials where you take every output of the function and differentiate with respect to every input. So in this case, the Jacobian, dz, f of z, oops, I wrote m by n there, it should be n by n, not m by m. I guess that's fine. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm giving the, the um, general definition of the Jacobian here, but in our case, we're going to actually only be worried about the case where m equals n. So in our case here, this will be a matrix which is n by n, and its entries f, z, i, j, this will equal the different partial derivatives. So uh, let me make sure I have my uh, indices right here. So this, the i, j element here will be the derivative of the i output uh, with respect to the j input. And that'll be a square matrix because there are as many outputs as inputs. The analog of Newton's method for the multivariate case is you again just form a linear approximation. And what that actually is in this time, so our approximation now to our function of z prime say, this is actually now, well we have f of z plus the Jacobian dz f z times this difference, z prime minus z. And that is actually identical to what we had before. That is the, um, what this is, is this is the multivariate analog of forming a linear approximation to the function, where now all those derivatives are the same, but this is a linear function. We set this equal to zero, and what we get from that are the updates that say z prime is, or z rather, I'll just not, not talk about z prime and z, but setting this thing equal to zero, we get the update that z equals z minus Jacobian inverse f inverse times f of z. Okay. And don't worry if this takes a second to sort of get. The, the, the idea here is we're doing the same thing as in the linear case, as in the 1D case. We're forming a linear approximation to the function at that point, at z. We're setting that linear approximation to equal to zero. That we can solve because that's a linear function. We solve it just by inverting a matrix, namely we invert the Jacobian. And what you get from that are these updates that say z, you set z to be equal to z minus 
the Jacobian inverse times the function's value. And you repeat that process, hopefully until you get a z that actually gives you uh, the solution such that, that, that f of z equals zero. In general, you may have to actually sort of temper these updates. You may not have to take a, a full step. You may take to, to, you know, minus 0 0.5 times this. Sometimes you have to do things like that. We won't worry about that. We'll worry about just the cases where just this plain update will actually work. Um, what sort of half an update corresponds to is you, you don't go all the way to zero. You kind of go halfway to the zero point, something like that. You kind of want to, to play it safe a little bit. And by the way, that, that, that's actually necessary because you can have functions like this. Um, sorry, maybe I, I'll, I'll just write it over here. You can have functions like this. Um, and you want to find a zero of that. And if you take the linear approximation here, it kind of shoots you really far out. And so you're over further out over here. And you can actually diverge to infinity doing this thing. So sometimes you have to take kind of smaller steps in this thing. Sometimes it won't find a solution at all because there is no solution or it's just stuck in the wrong optima or something like that. Um, but in general, in the cases we'll talk about, you can, you can actually solve this. Now starting next time, what we'll do is we'll describe how you use this, not just to find the zero of some function, but in particular when that function is itself the gradient of our cost function. So remember, this is a function that has n outputs. The gradient you can also think of as a function with, you know, takes as input a, a parameter, produces n outputs because it's all the gradient terms. So we'll actually use this function to find a point where the gradient is equal to zero. So we'll think of the gradient as being our function f, and we'll use Newton's method to find a point where the gradient is equal to zero. Um, and that's sort of the, a preview for next time when we talk about Newton's method for logistic regression. Any questions before we go? Okay, see you all next time.